Jesus is dealing with uh, a portion that's known as the six antitheses. It's an antithetical statement. And some have wrongly concluded on this portion that Jesus was actually giving a new law here, that somehow he was uh, uh, abrogating Moses in, in that regard. Something's different here. But as we've noted, on every single one of these, Jesus introduces these antitheses by saying, and you have heard it said, or you have heard. When Jesus is quoting the Old Testament, he repeatedly says, it is written, it is written. So what he's doing in the six antitheses is correcting the oral tradition that has come, come down from the scribes in regards to interpreting the law of God. So that's what he's setting straight in this particular category. And this morning our study has brought us to the thorny topic of divorce and remarriage. Now, I, I mentioned to you in the introduction that the Sermon on the Mount in a lot of ways comprises the, the cliff notes of Jesus' ministry. And I said that because in one way or another, much of Jesus' teaching over three years is briefly touched upon in this section of Scripture. And so here we are again with another whole topic that he addresses in other places concerning marriage and divorce. So let's plow into this, picking up at chapter 5, beginning at verse 31. We read these words, And it was said... So you get the same idea. You have heard it was said. And it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the cause of unchastity makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I can't begin to tell you the controversy that exists in the church over this section of Scripture. Now, there is a backstory to this, and it helps us in understanding the scripture if we know what the situation was that was going on at the time. I mean, what were people talking about? <coughs> how, how, what was the cultural influences? That comes into play with this particular issue that's here. So the backstory is that there were two rabbinic schools. Again, these are not mentioned in the scripture, but they were there. One was called the school of Hillel, and the other was the school of Shammai. Rabbi Shammai taught in his school, Rabbi Hillel in the other. Now, the heart of this debate was picked up in those two schools, and it centers on chapter 24 of the book of Deuteronomy. So when Jesus picks up the statement and says, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce, now I'm going to take you back to Moses' teaching in chapter 24 of the book of Deuteronomy. 24 verse 1 reads this way, when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes, but he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her away from his house. It continues, but we're going to leave that right there. Note the word that's used in verse 24, verse 1, indecency. Could read also unseemly. Now, in the first century, Shammai taught that the only ground for divorce was a grave offense, picking up on this word indecency, unseemly. The other side of it was Hillel, which was lax. Rather than rigorous, he interpreted unseemly in the most broad way. In other words, to put it in the vernacular of today, Hillel's position was the no-fault position taken today in the United States and in most countries around the world. No-fault divorce. This is the first occurrence of that you could look at, maybe historically. 
uh, as it existed. And it was a background controversy that was going on at the time. The school of Shammai, the school of Hillel. I think there is, there were, uh, and Jesus will pick up again on chapter 19, this will be articulated again. The, the Pharisees want to know, well, where do you stand on this? Where are you coming from? John Stott notes this, any trivial offense found in the wife could be cause, okay? <clears throat> she burned the dinner. That's it. She's out, you know? Okay? A anything would go. Ra rather, Shammai was on the narrow side of it. Indecency would probably have to be something immoral. At the time, it was considered immoral, Obviously, if she was in sexually involved with someone else, there was also a ground in there because of the creation ordinances in regards to marrying and having children. If she was not bearing children, in a lot of Jewish thinking, that was also ground for divorce. The Pharisees, of course, were preoccupied with the grounds for divorce Jesus was preoccupied with the institution of marriage. Note that Jesus' reply here, especially in chapter 19, which I didn't read, this is when he actually comes and he's presented this same question. Uh, it's not really a reply. Divorce is one cause, or is it several causes for this? The counter was in the form of a question going back to Genesis 1, where Jesus talks about this and design. The Pharisees called Moses' provision for divorce a command. Jesus called it a concession because of the hardness of their hearts. So let's read the whole section here in chapter 24 of Deuteronomy. I only read the first verse. Let me give you the whole context now. Verse 1. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that he, she, find, she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her word there. And he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from the house. And she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And if the later husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then the, her former husband who had sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife, since she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. This is where we get this language, the certificate was to be issued if divorce occurred. Now, the Pharisees distorted the conciliatory meaning of this. The regulation of Moses was due to men's hard hearts because God knew divorce would occur. So later on, when we skip and we get to chapter 19 of Matthew, he records this as well. Jesus has put this question in your response in chapter 19, verse 8. He said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. So... <coughs> The Pharisees regarded divorce lightly. Jesus took it so seriously, at least in this particular encounter, except with one exception, divorce shouldn't occur. What Jesus does here is that he presupposes a high view of marriage when, with this one exception, it is a high view of marriage which likewise, under, uh, likewise underlies Jesus' remarks here in chapter 5. Now, Paul adds, it seems to me, a second ground for divorce. Jesus is saying immorality would be a ground for divorce. Paul seems to add another one here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He's dealing with that, and, and Jason dealt with this uh, several weeks ago. Let me just read this real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verses 14 and 15, he's dealing with relationships here with marriages. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through the believing husband. 
for otherwise her, your children are unclean, but now they are holy. What that's, that's, this, that's a great sermon right there on covenant theology. The idea being that even if you have one of the partners who's married to an unbeliever, there is covenantally some kind of favor on the household because of the position of faith of the one. And it even extends down not to the unbelieving spouse alone, but also to the children. So there's a sense in which there's a blessing, a, 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 a covering that is over the household because of that. He continues. Yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Now, historically, that's been understood as a second ground for divorce. The unbelieving partner that doesn't want any part of the marriage for whatever reason, it might be for spiritual reasons, it may not be, they end up leaving. That becomes another ground for divorce. But what can we say about this? Because divorce <coughs> and remarriage is such a big thing. The statistics are 50% of the population of North America has been divorced, and that statistical ratio has held in the church as well. You got 50% of the people that are in the church. Consider this as well, that as the gospel is going out from the church to the unbelieving and you're bringing people into the household of faith, they're coming from those same ratios as well. So you get people who were either in the world or they were in the church at the time, but the ones specifically that were in the world, they may have been divorced while they were in the world. Now they've come to Christ now they're coming into the church. So what do we say about all of this? <clears throat> well, I've done a lot of studies on this in years past, and, and where I've come down on this is that when you get into the case law in the Old Testament on any issue, divorce being simply one, it is literally impossible, and it was not the intent of Moses' instruction to give every single scenario that could possibly happen in re with respect to the relationships that men and women have with one another and how they carry out their business dealings, marriage relationships. You get tons of information on contract law that comes down from the Ten Commandments, but it's you don't have to go too far in that and you find situations that don't quite fit into what exactly was touched on. You know, your neighbor kills your ox. I mean, there's, infer there's data on this. It's like, well, how do we handle this? Uh, well, how they should pay back, back. But what if it wasn't an ox? You know, what if it was a flock of chickens? It doesn't say anything about a flock of chickens. <coughs> what about this one? There's all of these things. What did they do? What they did was, it was brought before the judges of Israel, and the judges of Israel were a plurality of elders, and they sat and did what Moses had been doing in judging cases. Now, we get a lot of information on this within the Old Testament at the beginning when elders are appointed for Israel. You might remember the story. Moses and, and it says, morning to night, which is a Hebrew, Hebrew idiom there, it just meant all day long, he was sitting and was preoccupied with judging cases, okay? They were lined up, you know, not out the door, but out the tent, going around the corner, all over the place with all kinds of problems of people dealing with each other. I'm sure some of them were marriages, but some of them were business relationships. Some of them was like, hey, look, my tent is right next to these people next door. They got kids that are out of control. I can't even sleep at night. What am I supposed to do with them? They're going all this way. It's Jethro, who is Moses' father-in-law, that comes to him and says, you can't be doing this. You, you, you need to appoint other men to handle this. Okay. Now, this is the official beginning of what we have nomenclature for in this church of ruling elders. Okay? What do elders do? They make rulings. Okay? This is the beginning of the beginning of this. 
you can even find the presence of elders even before this time of individuals that were respected in the community to help deal with some issues in the, in the nation, you know, in, in, in the uh, commonwealth. But this is the official beginning of this, okay? Where you'd have men that pick up the responsibility of making judgments. Now get the word here, determinations, judgments. Well, if someone comes along and says, well, I thought the scripture says we're not supposed to make judgments. Judge not lest you be judged, right? We are not to make censorious judgments whereby I want to point out your faults to make me look better. But elders collectively make judgments. That's what they do. In fact, that's why in the nomenclature of this church, the session is considered court one, it is a court, and on top of that sits the Court of Appeals, known as a presbytery, and if it needs to go to the Supreme Court, it goes to the Third Court, which is the General Assembly. That's why that is situated that way. And what these men would do was, as the law was then written down, as Moses' sermons were collected, which is largely what Deuteronomy is, they took the law, and then as best they could, they would apply it to each situation that was coming before them. That's what they did. That's the primary thing that they did. I mean, this whole understanding that basically, yelled, ah, what they do is, you know, they basically oversee the money of the church and, you know, what color the carpeting is and the rest of that. Elders' jobs in a church are two things they're supposed to do. Number one, el- and, well, let me back up. Elders, elders in a local church are members of the church and are elected by the congregation. You guys all know that. Pastors are not. Jim's not a member. I'm not a member. Neither is Jason. We're members of the presbytery. The presbytery has authority over us. The presbytery has authority of removing or installing somebody here. But those ruling elders are members of this church, and so they have two primary jobs that they're supposed to do. Number one, they sit there every Sunday week, Sunday, and they listen to what's being taught and preached. And they are listening for heresy. They are listening, is this right? Does this make sense? Does this fit with what I've been taught in the past? Because they are the gatekeepers. They are to protect the sheep. If there's something wrong in the teaching of the church, if there's something wrong in the Christian education department of the church, it's the elders' responsibility. They've got to protect the fidelity of the preaching of the word of God. Number two, the other thing that they do is that they maintain discipline within the church. Those are the two things they do. And the discipline of the church involves hearing cases and making determinations. In the Old Testament, this is so important, and it's beyond my scope to teach all of this today, I'll just mention it, that there are times when the language will be used, take it to the elders, and at other places they'll say, take it to God. And the idea was they were one in the same. That when elders speak, not individually, but collectively, it comes with the force of God's wisdom and direction. That's what it's supposed to be. Now, a lot of times that ain't what it is, but that's what it is supposed to be. So, the application here regarding divorce 
is one of these cases that's brought before a session, it should be ideally, let's work from the ideal and then we'll go to the obscure. The ideal would be you have a couple, they're struggling in their relationship, and because it's a covenantal arrangement, they both have said publicly, I promise that I'm going to stay with you the rest of my life, right? Is it till death, what? Do us part, right? So now one of them or both of them are saying, I ain't doing it anymore. I'm getting out of this. Because it's a point of a covenant that's made, because it's an ordinance that God has directed for men and women to be formally connected to one another in this way, and there's a possibility that it's going to end, here's the part you need to see. Christians don't have the power to be hopping in and out of that kind of a relationship without any sanction. Now, I'll be the first to admit, in the overwhelming 99% of the cases, it happens all the time. And it happens because of two reasons. A, because a lot of times people in the church are like, I'm not going to anybody, I'm doing my own thing. No one else knows what it's like me living with her or him. <laughs> and number two, the leadership of the church is, I ain't touching that. We're, we're not going there. In both cases, that's wrong. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Elders are supposed to be involved in those kind of things. And so they're, they're working, okay? They're working to try to hold that marriage together. They're, a session can do several things in this count. They can provide counsel. They can provide support. And most importantly, they can call out sin. That's what they do. Now remember, I'm not saying it's the pastor. I'm not saying it's the clerk. I'm saying it's the session. Look carefully in your Bibles, and you'll see in the New Testament, it's always a plurality. It's the elders of Ephesus, right? It's a point, Paul says, a point elders. You never hear him talking about it in the singular. Why? Because there's a collective sense about that, that there's a protection. Every one of them is weak in themselves. But when they come together as a session, it's the aggregate is the strength of the whole. That's the importance of that. And so it's elders who are not emotionally attached to make the determination. You know, it's one thing if you're going through marital troubles and you go to your mother or your dad or your brother. I mean, where do you think they're going to come down on that? Of course they're going to be sympathetic in most cases. Your best friends, right? Elders are supposed to be non-biased. They are concerned about the fidelity of the church and the well-being of the sheep that are a part of the church. That's what they do and they make determinations, and they make judgments. This is wrong. This is a wrong attitude. And they might be involved in instructing, there needs to be marital counseling here. We are recommending you do such and such a thing. Here are a number of passages of scriptures we want you to review. We want you to maybe attach yourselves to a certain couple in the church for some oversight to walk you through this. There are all different kinds of things that they might be involved with. Maybe, maybe things are so hostile. Maybe there's an animosity that's going on here. They might even say, for a period of time, we're going to suspend you from the sacrament of communion. Now, what that's done, that's for two reasons. A, because the, the Scripture says if you come to have the Lord's Supper and you better judge yourself rightly before you do that because you've been eating judgment to yourself if you've got a hardness of heart that's there, right? Elders need to be really concerned about this because when you get into marital couples and there's, there's an estrangement between them or it's a, to the point of divorce, divorce is, we're saying, this is irreconcilable. 
right? Well, isn't it the Christian church that's been given the gospel of reconciliation? And this is why I'm trying to understand. You can't just go hopping in and out of these kinds of relationships. This is really serious stuff. That's why these elders, they need to be involved in this. It may be a justifiable circumstance where a divorce has to happen. But in those cases, it would be the session having determined and settled in its mind, we thought this through, we've prayed about it, we've counseled on this, and now we're going to grant this. Now, you, you guys know I was here for 40 years. I mean, on members, on members that were part of this congregation, we had this come up a couple of times, not many. I was always pleased with the elders worked very, very hard on trying to keep marriages together over the years, very hard. But there were some times when it didn't work. In those cases, we had to make a decision here. Okay, there's usually always sin on both sides, but in, in, in the overwhelming majority of cases, what you end up with is that there is significant sin with one of the parties that's breaking this thing up. And it was the session that would say, we feel in regards to Mary Jane this is a justifiable divorce. And we did that, and my, my memory is the best I can say over the years, two times. And I told, in both cases they were women, in both cases I said, now take this letter and stick this in your safety deposit box. Because what this proves is, you didn't just decide this on your own. This went before an ecclesiastical court, and that court reviewed the material and made a decision. If anyone ever calls into question the justification of what took place, hence, you can pull out this letter, which comes with the full authority of this session, that says this was reviewed and this was the decision. That is a covering. That is what's supposed to happen. But in the overwhelming majority of cases, it didn't. But that's the way it is supposed to work. Now, let's talk about, is this the only, are these the only reasons? Is it only immorality, or is it only because of the unbelieving spouse wanting to depart? Well, I think what's going on here in regards to Jesus' teaching on this is that he's dealing with the controversy that's at hand. I think what he basically was saying is he sided with Shammai, he dealt with Hillel, and really didn't deal with anything else that was there because it wasn't a point of discussion. So let me give you another text that comes out of the teaching of Moses. And let's examine this. That was also a part of Jewish thought at the time. But it really wasn't exegeted, particularly in the New Testament. But we have it here. Exodus chapter 21, we read these words, verse 7. And if a man sells his daughter as a female slave, she is not to go free as the male slaves do, if she is displeasing in the eyes of her master who designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He does not have authority to sell her to a foreign people because of his unfairness to her. And if he designates her for his son, listen, he shall deal with her according to the custom of the daughters. If he takes to himself another woman, he may not reduce her food, clothing, conjugal rights. Some translate that as love. And if he does not these three things for her, then she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. Now, the Bible does not deal exhaustively with all of the deplorable conditions that arise from marriages. 
Although the Bible does not explicitly state reasons beyond infidelity and desertion, it seems more legitimate reasons may exist so by duly ordained multiple elders functioning as a spiritual court may take into account. An example of this line of thinking is noted above. Let me work you through this text. If you have questions, let's hold them until I get through it, and then we'll look at them. So if a man sells his daughter, I'm looking here, verse 7. If a man sells his daughter to be a maidservant, among the ancient nations, fathers' rights over their children were generally regarded as including the right to sell them as slaves. In civilized nations, the right was seldom exercised, but what restrained men was rather the sentiment of pride than any doubt of such sale being proper. Many barbarous nations participated in this. Existing customs, it is clear, sanctioned such sales among the Hebrews, and what the law now did was to step in and mitigate in evil consequences. These were the greatest cases in with respects to females. Usually they were bought to be made concubines or secondary wives for their masters. If this intention were carried out, then they were entitled to their status and their maintenance as wives during their lifetime, even though their husbands took a legitimate wife in verse 10. Okay, skipping down. That was verse 7, verse 8. If she pleases not her master, that is, if he declined or to carry out the contract to take her as his wife, then it says here, then let her be redeemed. Rather, that is, then let him cause her to be redeemed. Uh, Moving down to verse 9. And if he hath betrothed her unto his son, a man might be brought a man might have bought the maiden for his, this object, or finding himself not pleased with her in verse 8, might have made his son take his place as her husband. In this case, but one course was allowed. He must give her the status of a daughter in his family. Verse 10, if he takes him another wife, i.e., he marries her himself and then takes another woman, a legitimate wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall not be diminished. Verse 11, if he does not do these three unto her, the three points of the latter part of verse 10, we talked about those, she shall go out free. She shall not be restrained, and she shall be free as a maidservant. Now here's what we need to understand about this. This is law that's in the case law. In fact, it's in the book of the covenant. So the Ten Commandments have just been given in chapter 20. So we're in chapter 21, and this is going to run through chapter 23, all these various kinds of laws. This is one of the ones that's in there. It was commonly understood in Jewish thought this was ground for divorce. Why? Arguing from the lesser to the greater. If the law of God provided protection for a woman who was at a concubine status, if she was a slave girl in this regard, if she was to be protected in this way, arguing again, lesser to the greater, how much more would it be apparent for a woman who was a full-fledged wife to have a justifiable divorce if she was being abused in these ways? You You see the thinking here? Jesus never dealt with this because I don't think that was the point of discussion at the time. I think the point of discussion at the time were the two schools of thought, Hillel and Shammai. He he sides with Shammai against Hillel, but he didn't deal with this. So if you look at this carefully though, and the way it reads, (coughs) if he takes another woman to himself, he may not reduce her food, her clothing, or her conjugal rights. It could also read love. Anybody that's in a troubled marriage can come up and basically say, my, my spouse doesn't love me. You know, they're not fair with me. There's an infinite number of problems that men and women have with each other in marriages, right? The key thing here is, again, the necessity of the elders, because it was the board of elders that would have to hear the case. 
That's again why it's called a court. Okay, this is the way it's supposed to work. So what they do then is they take into account everything that's written, and let's look at it from a New Testament perspective, the, the centrality of elders governing the people of God in the Old Testament is brought forward in the New Testament. You have the inception of elders. Paul is telling Timothy and Titus, appoint elders wherever you go. Here's the qualifications for them. They govern in a plural arrangement for this purpose to oversee God's people. And they hear these cases. So what they end up doing is they take these things that are said by the Lord Jesus, by Paul, by what uh, Moses is saying on this particular issue, it has to d deals with divorce, and they look at the situation that's before them and they do as best they can to apply it and come up with a rendering in the matter. That's the way it works. The Bible doesn't address every single circumstance that comes up with all of the disagreements we have with each other. Elders cannot fix a marriage. They can be supportive, they can counsel, they can give directions on how things might be mitigated, but most importantly, they can call out sin. And that's what they're looking for. And so in a lot of these cases, we got a bad situation that we're trying to find something that honors God in a very impossible circumstance. And that's what they're supposed to be doing. Now, the truth of it, though, is as we were growing and the church was moving along, we were picking up people from all over the place. Who, again, that they had been married, they had been divorced, and all the rest of that. It already happened. You know, we can't handle all of that because it's already there. But once they're here, this is how it's supposed to work. It's totally out of favor, though. You know, membership's out of favor. Again, people who attend, <coughs> people who attend the church, officially, the elders have no power over them. It's that membership. It's that question number five in the membership that gives them all the power. At the end, you know, when you go through those five questions, Jason's up here with new people coming in. It says, do you submit <clears throat> to the government and discipline of Community Evangelical Presbyterian Church and to this session? And do you promise to promote the unity, purity, and peace of the church? Question number five. Yes. They say that publicly, that gives me a right, then, to be able to say, how are things going? You know? Well, I understand that, you know, Sister Sally Sue is no longer living at home, and she's living with her parents over here. Uh, we maybe need to look into that matter, you know? It, it's an estrangement! It's an it's a unreconciled situation. We're about reconciliation, aren't we? Isn't that what Paul said? I've given you the ministry of reconciliation. Of course we ought to be in that. But I, really, there's as much wrongdoing on this on the, in regards to leadership as there is in the rank and file of the church because the leadership is preoccupied with other things or they don't want to get them, just, they just don't want to get involved with it I mean, that's how I ended up writing my book uh, uh, about this whole thing. I mean, it, it, this, if you're a member, you should see this as, this is a covering. This is a protection for you. You want people, when you're in crisis, you want people who love you enough to tell you the things you don't want to hear. That's what, that's what elders do collectively. It's to, to not just simply encourage you and hold your hand going through something, but it's also at those times when, you know, I'm angry. I, I've been wronged. You know, and you can download to them, but they're always listening of how to apply the word of God to your particular situation 
that we may be all built up in the faith. That's what they're doing. So when Jesus approaches this whole topic, it, it's part of the Sermon on the Mount. It's one of these antitheses. You have heard, see, they, they've heard the Pharisaic part of this. They wanted to go with Hillel. Burn the, coal, burn the rice, done. We're out of here. You know, anything and anything to get out of the whole relationship. Jesus comes in first of all and says, look, no, we're not doing that. There have been abuse situations from the beginning of time. You know, and even this whole thing with unbelievers, if the unbeliever wants to leave, let him go. The believer isn't bound in such cases. Well, what do you do with a situation where you got an unbeliever? They didn't physically walk out the door and move to the next state. They're living there, but they're not there. You know, I got, I got a wife, all right, I, 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 got, I got a husband, he's there, he eats all the food, but he's not there. It's the elders have to get involved in that. And I won't tell you, this is hard work. It's exceedingly hard work if it's done well and it's done right. You're trying to best you can discern the situation and come up with the best bandage to try to hold it together. And in some cases, it doesn't work. And then there has to be a determination made. We think, in, vi in view of these facts, that this is what needs to happen. So I think you've definitely got two ne New Testament ways to go on this. You have sexual immorality for, for, again, let's talk about that for a minute. Okay, so somebody comes into my office, I want a divorce, why? My husband, he, 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 he was out and he came home the other night and he, he got involved with his secretary. They, they, they were having sex. Well, besides trying to be compassionate, I want to know, has this ever happened before? Well, no, it hasn't happened before. Okay. So what we know here is this is a really injurious blow to the relationship, that's for sure. But it hasn't been a repetitive thing <coughs> that's happened. It hasn't been repeated. So the one thing I'm immediately you're still trying to do, is there any way we can still preserve this at this point? Because again, forgive us what? As what? Okay, so even is, is infidelity, is it the unpardonable sin? So even at that point, the session is still trying to work. Okay, I know you're injured, you're hurt on this. We gotta bring in, uh, you know, we gotta bring in Mr. Schmo here, and we gotta sit down and talk with him about this. We gotta get to the, but we're gonna try to work this through as best we can, see? But what if it, you're working with them and Mr. Schmo is beginning to have a track record of this? I'll tell you, if, on one of the cases that we had where the, or there was a, a, a certificate, uh, not a certificate, but a, a statement that was rendered by the session of this church, justifiable reason for a woman to seek divorce, wasn't even because of physical adultery. It was because of repetitive voyeurism and pornography usage over years. Okay? We worked and worked and worked and worked on that. But it was over years. And the, the woman, you know, it, Jesus said, if you even look at another woman with what? Lust in your eyes, okay? It was over a long period of time. We end up saying, we're going to grant this. This is adultery, and it's repetitive, and it's unrepentant. The fact that you're continuing in the sin is indication there's no repentance. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for repentance. See that? All right. I can't 
cover everything on this. It's, it's a big issue. But I have written on it. So, to make it easy, in your bulletin, where it has the little caption there about this class being taught, Miss Debbie back there, she put it in for me. She put my website in. ITMDG.org. It's right in your bulletin. International Theological Mission, Don Gallardi. If you go to that website and click, pull down the bar for the menu, and you click on resources, it'll be the, I think it's the second or third thing that'll come up, divorce and remarriage. That was the most extensive study that I could do on it. There's probably more there than what you want, but it covers it from every angle I can possibly cover it from at the time. So if you want to explore that more, that'd be a place to go. Secondly, if you're sitting here and you come from a background where maybe you had a bad marriage that happened, you got divorced, you've gotten remarried, you know, and you're wondering about all these things, I mean, look, the truth of the matter is, God is a merciful God, you know? Uh, most of the times that I have found in overwhelming majority of cases, Christians just didn't even have the right information when these kinds of things happened at the time. And so, is the mercy of God there for these kinds of sins? Are you living in adultery because you married somebody in this kind of circumstance? I would say no. And the overwhelming majority of elders would say no. Your Westminster Confession of Faith has a chapter on divorce and remarriage because they thought it was so important that it needed to be included there. It happens, but it needs to be overseen. And if you came here and it wasn't in the past, well, praise the Lord for the grace of God and know that you're at some place now that is concerned about that, that does love you and wants to help you in all of the situations that you're in. I got time for one question if you got it. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. It's under, uh, uh, it's right here. It says Sermon on the Mount, my class, and it says oh, okay. website, itmdg.org. Okay? Go to resources, look for divorce and remarriage, it's there. If you have any questions on it, you can call me this week. We're going to continue our study in the Sermon on the Mount. Let's go to the Lord. And let's use this as a prayer this morning, because we're talking about irreconcilable states. I want to end this by noting we are in a reconciled state, and Jesus will never divorce us. And we are unfaithful all the time. And he is never unfaithful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the grace that is in the scripture regarding your design for your people. All of us, Lord, have sin and problems and things that we've done in the past, things that were done to us, things that we did, things that we thought. We thank you that there is grace at the foot of that cross and for your faithfulness to us, Lord. So we handled a difficult topic this morning, and nonetheless, it was important enough that here it is in the Word of God, not, a, not the least of which in the Sermon on the Mount, regarding this whole issue of divorce. And